our town hall meeting with a prayer by Dr. Lamont Williams. Would you join us in a moment of prayer? Shall we pray at this time? Gracious Father, thank you now for a time well spent in this virtual space. We invite you, Father, now to enlighten us, inform us, and inspire us uh, from the gathering that we should have today. Let every participant into your name be prayed. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And again, good evening. My name is Goldie Bird. I'm director of the Myangelo Center for Health Equity at Wake Forest School of Medicine. We're so delighted that you joined us tonight for a very important conversation. About 10 months ago, we were just inundated with this virus that has done such damage to our communities and our society and all parts of our society. And so we have tried to keep up with our community, keep our community engaged and up to date in what was going on. So we decided that we needed a town hall meeting, a discussion about what is now new, which is the coronavirus vaccine. So we are so delighted to have such a distinguished panel tonight. Uh, we will begin our discussion with uh, Dr. John Sanders. Dr. Sanders is Chief of Infectious Disease uh, here at Wake Forest Baptist Health. Uh, we will also have Dr. Michelle Law, who will be joining us in just a few minutes, a little bit later. But after Dr. Dr. Sanders, uh, we're very happy to have the president of the um, North Carolina NAACP, Dr. T. Anthony Spearman. We're also happy to have um, uh, the vice president of the General State Baptist Convention, Dr. Chris Rivers. Very happy to have all of you on board tonight, and Dr. James, Attorney James Terry of the uh, Winston Salem Urban League. So these panelists will talk to us tonight about the, the COVID uh, virus vaccine. Uh, Dr. Sanders I, and I hang out, it seems, all the time. We were on a call earlier today. He and uh, Allison Matthews, who will assist us with our question and answer period, and she will provide for you a call-in number that you can use to call in questions. We have a series of questions already. People have been very interested in this vaccine topic. So they've already sent in questions, but we would also like to hear uh, from you, our listening audience tonight. So we will begin, I will stop because we have so much to do. We have so much conversation tonight, and we do encourage you to send in questions as soon as Dr. Matthew gives you that number in just a few minutes. So we'll start with, with um, Dr. Sanders, why don't you give us a little bit about this virus and about the vaccine, and then we will move forward to our community panelists after you. Thank you, Dr. Bird, and it's a, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. This is, a, um, I learned so much on these town halls, and I am really grateful for the opportunity to, to get to participate. And frankly, while COVID-19 has been just a terrible disease, there's a there's a silver lining in every cloud, and one of them for me is that I have gotten to hang out with you a lot more. And so uh, that's, uh, that, that is a, a, an unexpected pleasure for me. So just to remind everybody what COVID is, it is caused by a virus, a coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2. The reason it's called SARS-CoV-2 is that SARS, uh, like the SARS that broke out about a decade ago, um, that's a, uh, um, but it's it's just the syndrome of acute respiratory failure that uh, that goes along with that infection. And so when this virus came out, they said it looks a lot like that virus. So that's the SARS virus, the coronavirus, and this one they named SARS coronavirus, CoV-2, the second one that looks like that. Those are not the only two coronaviruses that infect people. There are, there's also MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, and then four others that just cause our typical bad cold symptoms every year uh, that we circulate. Um, so that virus emerged, and we don't have vaccines against those others, but fortunately, because SARS was such a scary virus, a lot of work had already been done to develop vaccines against SARS and other coronaviruses. Coronaviruses occur in every animal that we know, 
And there has always been a lot of worries that one might jump from an animal into people and cause these symptoms. And we think that's exactly what happened with this one. It jumped from bats into people. And so fortunately, our scientists were prepared because they've been working on this. And they've developed several great new different vaccines. And then Operation Warp Speed has pushed them through, through trials in record time. It does not mean that they're unsafe or they were done in any unsafe manner. It means that they just put a lot of effort into it and that citizens all over the country, all over the world, agreed to participate uh, in these studies. And then because we're in the middle of an epidemic, enough of them got sick that, that we could see exactly how effective the vaccines are. And we've got one that's now received emergency use authorization from the FDA. That's the vaccine made by Pfizer. And then just today, a second one received a vote of endorsement from an advisory panel to the FDA. So we fully expect that it will receive emergency use authorization by the FDA it, any, any moment or certainly within the next day or two. And that's the vaccine made by Moderna. And then there are several other vaccines that are in late stages in these trials, including one made by Johnson & Johnson and one made by AstraZeneca and others. And so there are a lot of vaccines coming out, two of which are already rolling out to, to, to be given to people. That's the Pfizer vaccine and then right behind it, the Moderna vaccine, we expect to roll out any moment. And they both are very effective. Um, 95% effective, and they've both been remarkably safe. So each of those studies had over 30,000 volunteers, and there were not there were no there were no serious adverse events in either one of those studies. And that is really remarkable. So very safe, very effective. I could not be more excited about uh, about all of this news coming out. So Dr. Bird, I will pause there. Dr. Sanders, thank you so much for that introduction. We're going to ask um, Dr. Prince Rivers now to talk to us about um, the General State Baptist Convention and its views on this and how your constituents think of, think of the, the COVID vaccine and, and your thoughts about how we should go forward. Thank you, Dr. Bird, and, and thank you, um, Dr. Sanders, as well. It's a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Uh, obviously, we're talking about a very important um, issue, and the General Baptist Convention of North Carolina represents about 1,600 African American uh, Baptist churches around the state, uh, probably about a half million uh, members. You can imagine with that size organization, we have a variety of views within uh, our congregations. Uh, so I will speak about what I know. And, uh, and do that the best I can. Uh, I really think from what I'm hearing, you have uh, uh, kind of the spectrum, the full spectrum of opinions about the vaccine. There are, there are people like myself who are really excited that the vaccine is available, uh, and will be more widely available very soon. Um, this to me has economic implications. It has social implications. It has educational implications. And uh, certainly we don't want to see children continue to have to learn uh, and relearn how to learn in this, in this virtual environment. So getting children back in school will be a welcome, uh, uh, a welcome uh, result of the vaccine. Houses of worship filled again with, with people. Um, as soon as that is safe to do so, that, that is something that many of us miss. I do also know and I'm aware that there are individuals who have some reluctance uh, regarding the vaccine, um, there, as we know, is a history of, of mistrust um, in marginalized communities uh, when it comes to science and how um, uh, research has or has not benefited marginalized communities. Uh, we can certainly speak in North Carolina about eugenics. We can speak about the Tuskegee experiment. Um, I think these are very different than what we are dealing with now. I mean, these Vaccine studies are being done in the open, uh, in, in the public. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Kizzy Corbett at NIH is an African-American woman, one of the leading scientists who helped to develop 
uh, the vaccines. And so um, seeing uh, African Americans represented in the resolution of the uh, coronavirus pandemic is reassuring and should be reassuring to many people that um, their safety and well-being is taken is being taken into consideration. Thank you so much, Dr. Rivers, and thank you for bringing up those those things that have been problematic for particularly particularly for people who've been most impacted by the virus. Um, sometimes people find those things difficult to talk about, but they are important in our discussions. And as we're talking to our family members and our parishioners and our churches and other community-based organizations, these things are very important for all kinds of, of communities to learn about and to understand where they fit into our society and our history. So thank you for bringing those up. We're going to move on to Attorney Perry. Uh, just tell us who you are and, uh, and tell us about your constituents and, and where you are on this topic. Thank you for uh, having me and thank you for hosting this uh, very important conversation. Um, you know, so I'm CEO of the Winston-Salem Urban League and we're an organization that is focused on uh, creating mostly uh, employment and economic opportunities for uh, the African-American community and for other uh, disenfranchised communities. Uh, we, we, in addition to working on employment and economic opportunities, we also um, work on health issues. We have a mental health program, we have a program that helps people uh, get tested for sexually transmitted infections. Uh, we have a number of different programs, uh, even even housing. Uh, but so, you know, I, I think the, the place to start, that, which I think is inherent in what everyone uh, so far has said, is that this has been an unmitigated disaster for every community. Um, but certainly for African American communities, and particularly for the African American uh, community that we serve here in Winston Salem, uh, it, it has been. Uh, uh, harder hitting than it has been for white families. Um, you know, and, and there are a lot of reasons. I think one of them is that before COVID-19 um, hit, uh, African-American communities had lower levels of income and wealth, higher levels of unemployment, uh, greater levels of food insecurity, and, uh, and were disproportionately affected by a number of, of, of pre-existing healthcare conditions. Um, so, of course, when the disaster hit, uh, we saw it, uh, an incredible increase uh, in the in unemployment rate that peaked at 16.7 percent nationally, and we think we haven't um, well, we haven't been able to to formalize the numbers yet, but we think that that number uh, um, was about that high, if not higher, for the African American community here in Winston Salem. And a lot, a lot of that has to do with the fact that so many people in the African American community work in service industry jobs and hour, hourly jobs um, that. Um, that, that that were required to shut down. Uh, we also saw, um, of course, um, that there was a high effect on uh, Black-owned businesses. Um, you know, so many of the African-American businesses that we work with are in-person businesses. They couldn't really transition into um, becoming uh, strictly online businesses. And so that, that, that of course, made things uh, very difficult, and not only for the business owner, but, of course, for their staff. Um, we, and then I think um, we all know about the, the way in which this has been a challenge uh, for, uh, for our children. Uh, you know, for, um, for months and months and months now, um, schools have generally been closed unless you have access to a, a private school. And, of course, disproportionately, African-American and Latino students don't have access to private schooling um, and, and don't have um, the funds to pay for uh, two uh, tutors or, or other things that would keep their kids, uh, our kids, uh, up to speed. Um, and, then, and then, of course, we have seen that the rate of, of, of contract of COVID-19 in the African-American community across the nation has been higher than it has been for other communities. And again, a lot of this has to do with pre-existing conditions. So, I, you know, I, I think that, um, uh, that Pastor Rivers is absolutely right. Um, you know, it, it has been my experience over and over again when talking to folks that people are hesitant um, about the uh, about the vaccine, and it's and I think one of the points that I would push on folks is that you know, the idea that we've been going through this disaster since March, and that someone might be um, currently unemployed and, and dealing with all kinds of terrible issues because of this disaster, 
but they look at the cure, at the at the thing that or, 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 or um, the vaccination, and they say, well, I'm not sure, despite the fact that their life is in turmoil, is is huge, and and so what it's required me to do is to have really direct and upfront conversations in the same way that Pastor Rivers uh, just did about the Tuskegee experiment, about the North Carolina eugenics program. Uh, you know, one of the things that's pre pretty clear, I'm not, I'm not from Winston-Salem, I, I moved here about six years ago. I've run into so many people who um, uh, who were affected by the North Carolina eugenics program here in Winston-Salem. As a matter of fact, the, the gentleman who founded the Urban League, um, uh, Mayor uh, uh, James Haynes, uh, founded it in part um, because he um, uh, had been supportive of the eugenics program and uh, realized uh, his error and wanted to pay back um, the community. So one of the things that I've tried to, to, to do when having these conversations is to try to, to su suggest to people that this is a different time um, and that it's extremely unlikely that something like the Tuskegee experiment or the uh, eugenics program could be replicated in this time, particularly um, in response to something like COVID-19. And, and I think there are three fundamental differences about this moment in time as, as compared to the moment uh, the moments in time when those uh, uh, disasters happened, the, the Tuskegee experiment and the eugenics program. The first is that we're in the information age, um, and um, it is almost impossible to hide anything for any significant period of time in the information age. The information just flows, and, and, and so there, there just are very few secrets, um, thanks to Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, social media, et cetera. Uh, now, of course, uh, those same uh, entities are, are also ripe with misinformation, but it, it still is very difficult to, to hide something that is designed to, to harm um, people in general, but particularly an entire race of people. I think the second thing is that African Americans have a higher level of, um, of access to formal education. And so as, as pointed out earlier um, by, uh, by Pastor Rivers, uh, the, the lead doctor when it comes to this vaccine is African American, and, and, and there's so many uh, highly educated African Americans who um, who have expertise in this field and who are able to to vouch for this process and to vouch for um, the effectiveness of the vaccine. And, and then, last but not least, you know, I think one of the things that's important is when you think about the eugenics program. One of the things that's so stunning about it was that it was established by the state legislature. Um, and um, and so, you know, one of the things that someone said to me is, well, you know, this is a, a, another government funded or, or government support, supported or led activity. And I said, well, that's that's true. But here's, here's the third point, and that's that um, African-Americans have a higher level um, and the highest level we've ever had of political access. And so and that's, that's both about our ability to um, to engage in a political process as voters, but also it is that we have so many African-Americans who are elected officials um, who, um, who are the, 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 the vanguard, who are the folks who are standing guard to ensure that, that our communities are safe. And so any kind of formal process has to actually uh, uh, penetrate um, the leadership, uh, the political leadership of the African-American community. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think that, that people, um, that the majority of people will come around. Um, you know, one of the, the as, as much as I think we're all frustrated that the the rollout of the virus, I'm sorry, of the vaccine is going to be slow, um, and that it's you know, partially because it takes so long to, to ramp up, and because we want to make sure that we're treating uh, our first responders first. It also means that we're going to have a significant amount of time to see the effect of, of, of the vaccine and to see um, that, that after people take the vaccine, they remain healthy, and, um, and not only do they remain healthy, but they also um, hopefully are impervious for a significant amount of time to COVID-19. Wonderful. Thank you, Attorney First Terry. That was such great news. And um, thank you for reminding us of those pre-existing conditions and the, the, those social drivers that impact different populations of people um, disproportionately. And those things really do have driven the, uh, the, the, the disproportionate amount of burden from this virus. So that's very important. But, but as you pointed out, it is a new day. And the last thing we want are big swaps of people who, who are walking around sick or who are dying disproportionately. So thank you for that. Thank you. And, 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 and finally, um, is, is, uh, we're always honored to have Dr. Tia in the experiment. Uh, he's one of our, our pastors in our network, and he's always right there to say yes and to help 
any way he can. And as all of us know, he's all over the state doing all kinds of great work for people. Um, so Dr. Spearman, just tell us who you are again, and then tell us about the NAACP stats on this and how people have been impacted and, and tell us what we should be thinking about as a community leader statewide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bird. And I'm hoping that you all can hear me. I've been having some difficulties hearing you. And I appreciate all that I've heard from those who have preceded me. Um, and I'm always honored to be a part of any uh, event that the Maya Angelou Center for Healthy Equity uh, puts on. Uh, it is significantly important in these trying times in which we live. Um, I am the Reverend Dr. Candace Herman, the president of the North Carolina NAACP, which is the second largest state conference in these United States and largest among the southern states. Uh, we boast of approximately 20,000 members. Um, at, the, at the uppermost, we have 125 branches, including adult branches and youth and college division chapters. And they're sprinkled across the state prayerfully. We at least have one functioning uh, branch in each one of the 100 counties across the state of North Carolina. And we've been carrying out our mission, which is to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality of rights of all persons and to eliminate race-based discrimination. And for this cause, during these past nine months, we have been endeavoring to have our branches really in the throes of, of this pandemic, seeking to do all that they can to make sure that those of us and uh, uh, mainly uh, minorities are, are, are not forgotten during such a time as this. We all know that when COVID-19 befell us, that one of the things that it did do is to really reveal what we've been shouting for far, far too long. Uh, all of the broke, the broken de de democracy that we have, as well as all the disparities that minorities face, uh, racial disparities, economic disparities, health disparities, disparities within this so-called democracy that accumulate and grow increasingly worse the more we ignore them. And uh, so I, I want to, before saying some things about what we've been doing and what we've been uh, asking our branches to do, I want to give a shout out to Ronnie Long tonight. Uh, many of you may know Ronnie, the name Ronnie Long. He was an individual who spent 44 long, hard years behind bars that he was, he was wrongfully accused. And after 44 years, he has finally received his pardon. And so we are uh, really excited about that. The reason I mention it is because uh, there is at least one initiative that the North Carolina NAACP launched upon because of largely Ronnie Long, who was incarcerated at the time and uh, was, was, was going to be hearing from the Anbach Fourth uh, District Court. Uh, and, uh, and that's when COVID hit. And, uh, so we were very concerned that he might con contract the virus, but he did not and uh, is uh, out here and sensing some types of some freedom uh, at this point. So uh, uh, the things that we were asking our branches to do for the most part was to call for PPE uh, and, and to uh, for bus drivers, grocery, Store workers, uh, essential workers, that, that's what they started calling them, but it doesn't seem too much as if they become essential human beings as well. Uh, but we've also asked our uh, branches to be making sure that they stay in front of those who are in government offices and uh, to make sure that we're doing our government's best to make sure that we're adhering to some of the needs of the minority community. We, the North Carolina NAACP, has been very assiduous in staying before the governor uh, and asking for extensions, continued extensions on the moratorium uh, or and a moratorium on evictions. 
which we all know is, uh, you know, it, 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 the, our heaped upon our people, and many of them are going through all kinds of stress that is, is really unendurable. Um, as it relates to where we are in the point of time with this vaccine, uh, uh, hearing from uh, Dr. Rivers and uh, from Attorney Perry and Dr. Sanders, I think, yes, we, we are on a continuum. You know, we have, we have those on the end of the spectrum who are reluctant, and then we have those who are raring to go to uh, get the, get the uh, vaccine. And I think, for the most part, I'm I'm on that I'm on that end, um, knowing with the with the knowledge that as 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 uh, Brother Perry has said that uh, Kismikia Corbett and I think Dr. Rivers has said it as well uh, is one of us. As a matter of fact, a graduate of some of the schools here in the state of North Carolina, so she's that's very very close to home, and a reason for us to be triumphant enough that we will follow and do what needs to be done in terms of getting ourselves protected by the vaccine. But we're presently doing all that we can to make sure that the messaging is, 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 is cultivated such that individuals will not be intimidated by the things that we say. In other words, we don't want to make it sound to people as if we're, we're, we're pointing a finger at them and saying, you better do this and you better do that. But we, we don't want to do that. We want to appeal to them and, and to help them uh, or to their better judgment to help them come up with their own conclusions, their own decisions, but to give them as much and as good information as we possibly can give them uh, during this period of time. So uh, we are, we're doing our yeoman's best to make sure that we adhere to that. Um, and uh, we're, we're very hopeful that this, that the, that many people will begin to see uh, uh, the importance of uh, making their way when it comes uh, their time to do the back to get the vaccine that they will they will choose or opt to do so. Uh, lastly, one of the one of the things that we're certainly hearing is that the vaccine is going to be very. I mean, it sounds as if there's going to be a lot of uh, people, you know, vaccines going into the arms of folk. But you also need to know that there's a certain allotment that will come to the state at a certain time. And if when you are in the uh, number to receive it and you don't, and you don't do it, you ha you're hesitant for some reason, it's, there's no telling when it will come back around. Uh, so I just wanted to put that on the table uh, in hopes that, that, that someone in our audience will hear that and that may be what it takes to get them over the, over the edge. So thank you, uh, Dr. Goldie, for this opportunity again, and I appreciate all that we've heard this evening. I may have to jump off early because I have another Zoom. That's one of the things about this pandemic that has brought on uh, 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 these Zooms. You know, we're, we're moving from Zoom to Zoom to Zoom, uh, you know, <laughs> feeding, through this, feeding through this world. And our, our meetings are more vast than they were before. I uh, So uh, thank God for them. So thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Stevens. You're absolutely right. We've been zooming all day and almost every day. But you really brought up some wonderful points about another population that is so uh, <clears throat> disparate. I mean, there's so many disparities in our incarcerated populations, and that is certainly a population that has suffered disproportionately throughout COVID. Um, but but I, as you said, we, we certainly want to give people the appropriate information so that they can make good decisions on their on their own. So I, we really appreciate your bringing those comments. Uh, and in terms of, of who's going to get the vaccine, it's something that, that Dr. Laws is, is going to talk to us about when she gets to the call. She, too, had multiple Zooms tonight, right, Allison? And so when she comes, we'll, we'll give away so sure. she can give us some comments. So now we're going to open it up to questions, as we said. Um, we Dr. have a, a number of questions. Uh, Dr. Berry, Michelle Laws is here. Is she here? Oh, wonderful. Dr. Michelle Laws, I'm just going to stop so you can go ahead and, and tell us who you are and, and share a little bit about the, the vaccine and what the state of North Carolina is doing and who's going to get the vaccine if they choose at first and and how that's going to work. So thank you so much for being here. We knew that you had a, 
another obligation, but we're so happy that you're here. So glad to be with you all. You know, I love you and the work that you, both you and Allison, um, are doing and, and your valued partners with ours. So I wanted to um, pull up, and I'm hoping this is just pull up the distribution um, slide so that, and this is one I just finished. I want to pull it out of here, though. Um, I know. Yeah. So I want to go, I already have it. Uh, in a slide. So I'll go right there. Can you see the distribution slide? Okay, wonderful. Yes. So yes. it's an honor to be here. Um, I do want to first say that a lot of oh, a lot of the work that well, I'm pushing it, but I didn't mean to. A lot of the work that we have done on the state side at DHHS to get us ready for this day that we are in, right? So the Pfizer vaccine was delivered this week and we're hoping that the Moderna vaccine will be delivered soon and who knows where the other two are in the chain, Johnson and Johnson and, um, what is it? I uh, forget it, Merck, is it? Um, so we'll see where the other two are. But right now we did a lot to get us ready for this, this particular time in the, our response to the COVID pandemic. And so prior to, as the, as the pharmaceutical companies were, were making their way um, through the FDA's approval process, we knew that we needed to, we didn't need to wait to convene historically marginalized population um, stakeholders or from historically marginalized populations. We didn't need to wait to, to convene industry leaders. So there were several, committees and advisory groups that were working and have been working for several months. Dr. Bird is on one, helped lead one. Um, and so the three really were the COVID-19 um, Vaccine Advisory Committee, which Dr. Bird helped to really um, guide and then internally with external members, the historically marginalized populations advisory group, as well as the Vaccine Communications Advisory Group all worked, one, on the development of the state plan that was um, um, submitted in terms of how we are planning to distribute the vaccine and get people vaccinated. A lot of our work, we've applied this equity lens, and please forgive me if, I'm, if I go like through the slide. I'm, I'm pushing my button here. Um, trying to advance. A lot of our work that we've done has, has used an equity lens. And so, um, you know, I want to assure people that we recognize that, you know, it's, it, it, the, this was the perfect storm for this pandemic because the populations that are being hardest hit in the state and the populations that need to be in line for the vaccine up close in the line, at the front of the line, at the top of the line, the beginning of this process are populations that we've been serving um, in, through the pandemic, applying this equity lens, prioritizing them in terms of where we stood up testing, um, our med search work, our PH, um, P, um, uh, PPE work um, has really used this equity lens. And so the distribution of the vaccine is no different. And we are really looking at making sure that we are addressing a lot of the issues that are keeping people afraid of standing in line to take the vaccine. And one of the things I often say, and I'm just going through all of these because I, I don't want to do like I did the last time and, and spend too much time on things that I'm sure y'all have already covered, but I often say that past is prologue, right? And the people in our communities are not hesitant um, they're not fearful or mistrustful for no reason, and that they are not, you know, the study that was just released at North Carolina Central conducted, um, you know, African Americans are not willing to take the vaccine or to raise their hand quickly and say yes um, because of past, what I call past historical um, traumas. I'm trying to guide this thing, and it's not going the right way for me. Past historical trauma triggers. And so you've got Tuskegee, yes, everybody knows about that. Henrietta Lacks, everybody knows about that. Um, Dr. Sims, who's, you know, the father of gynecology, 
who honed his craft, butchering black women's reproductive organs. Um, you know, we these are the historical medical trauma triggers that have caused black folks to say, hold on, now I get it. I know we're dying at a higher rate, um, along with Latinx. I know our hospitalization rates are high. I know that the cases are high disproportionately compared to our percentage of the population, but they, they, I, I'm, I've been triggered now. This, the, I'm, I'm remembering what my grandma said, or I'm remembering what I learned in med school or public health, um, my public health program or my PhD program, or I remember what people have said in the community will happen if I allow, um, if I stand in line. I'm not trusting of this, of this medical process. And I often have to, not often, but I correct people within DHHS. It's not that black folks don't trust science. We don't trust how science has been used when it comes, or we've been used um, in, in the scientific process. So, Having said all that, which I know y'all already said, um, this is our distribution plan. The thinking that went into it is that there are going to be limited numbers of the vaccine, amounts of the vaccine, doses of the vaccine available um, in our state. And so who do we need to make sure is first in line, get vaccinated first? All those advisory groups, the recommendations from those advisory groups, as well as from federal, you know, advisory groups that were working on the vaccine um, plan, agree that our frontline healthcare workers, who uh, they are at the highest risk for exposure, coming in contact day to day with some of the sickest um, patients with um, uh, the COVID virus, COVID. And so those have to be the doctors, the nurses, and all the staff, all the healthcare workers that work on COVID units. And so, and I made sure, you know, I raised my hand every time we just said, we being DHHS, initially said doctors and nurses. And I said, well, wait a minute, you got housekeepers, you got, you know, CNAs, you got folks to come in and give the food. So um, they need to be on the list. And so they are on the list if they work on a unit, on a COVID unit. So that's something better than not the whole thing, right? And then our long-term care staff and residents, people in skilled nursing facilities and in adult and family care homes, all types. So I've gotten calls because my space that I work in normally in a non-COVID environment is in the um, mental health, substance use, IDD and TBI, traumatic brain injury space. And so um, I'm getting calls. Is my group home, you know, do I, I have a small group home. I have a six bed group home. All um, people in skilled nursing facilities and in adult, adult family um, care homes and um, group homes are, are first in line. Then right next to them are adults that have um, multiple chronic health conditions, MCCs, right? And so adults with two or more chronic conditions that put them at risk of severe illness and as defined by the CDC, and you can go on the CDC's website, they have a listing of what those are. So diabetes, hypertension, renal failure, um, um, you know, kidney disease, um, COPD, pulmonary diseases and illnesses and so forth, um, sickle cell and, and the like, and it's listed. Adults at high risk of exposure, including essential frontline workers. So we know that you know, about two thirds of the population of, of frontline workers are African American, and more of those are women or, or, or people of color. And then many of them are women. And so um, adults um, in these essential frontline um, workers positions, like teachers, child care workers, health care workers, and those um, living in prison homeless shelters, migrant and fishery housing, with, again, with multiple chronic health conditions, and we say multiple just being two or more. And those working in um, these facilities as well, and they don't have to have a chronic health condition. So we've gotten questions. Wait a minute. So only prisoners that are really sick are going to get vaccinated. So as it is right now, 
um, it's th that that's how they're falling in that category. And then um, the workers of these facilities, prisons, jails, and homeless shelters, do not have to have a chronic health condition. And then we move to the next phase. Um, and the next um, phase are adults at high risk for exposure and at um, increased rate of severe illness. So again, essential workers, those living in prisons and homeless shelters that are not, that don't have MC, don't, don't have multiple chronic conditions, and then our our senior population, age 60, uh, adult 65 and older. Adults under 65 with chronic, uh, with one chronic health condition that puts them at risk of severe illness is uh, are are also in this um, second stage or phase uh, uh, stage of the distribution. And then next on the line, next in line, are students and um, uh, critical industry workers, so college and university students, K through 12 students, um, and then those employed in jobs that are critical to society but are at lower risk. So um, people who are working in, um, you know, uh, facilities that are not long-term care or um, adult care homes, but they are um, important to or, con or considered as critical um, uh, positions. And that could be, you know, our, I often tell people, um, you know, those that are in positions that require our economy to keep going. Think of it that way. We haven't gone through the list and teased out all of what, who, who those people are. But critical industry workers is what we say. And then it's everybody else. You're not sick, you're not in a long-term care facility or a group home, not in prison, you don't, or jail, you don't have multiple chronic health conditions, you're not a doctor or nurse, and you don't work on a, um, a COVID unit. So that is the state distribution plan. Again, it was informed by multiple entities, uh, that weighed in multiple groups, advisory groups, and committees, and the like. And so with that, I will turn it back to um, you, Dr. Bird, or Dr. Matthew. So much. That was really informative as well. Um, I think everybody needs to know, uh, and I we just had something in the chat, Dr. Spearman says, can you send that distribution slide? So we can, we, do I, I can do that. I can do better than that. I will send it. But also, this information we set up, and, and yesterday we updated it to make sure that it has Spanish um, um, language version on our website. So if you go to DHHS's website, and I can drop it in the chat while we're chatting, um, there's a link to that, all things vaccines. And it even breaks down the clinical trials. Um, in my presentation you know, uh, to another group, um, you know, people ask, often ask, uh, what was the percentage of African Americans in these trials? And so we do, I do a whole thing on that. But all of that data can be found on um, on our website under the vaccines link, and I will I will drop that in the chat. Thank you, Thank you so much, Dr. Lawrence. We really appreciate your being here again and, and, and moving from Zoom to Zoom. So we, we, we really appreciate uh, all of you for making the time tonight. I have just one question. Again, we're going to move into our question and answer session. Uh, and Allison Matthews is going to, to lead us in our question and answer session. We have a number of questions, and she's going to also give us uh, a number that, that others can call in with questions. But there's one question that I've had so many times uh, this week and I uh, over the past few weeks actually, and I'm going to ask Dr. Sanders to come back. And, and 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 that question is: Is the virus in the vaccine, and how safe is it? And then and then we'll ask Alfred to come on and leave the Well, <clears throat> thanks, Dr. Bird. Uh, yeah, so the for the Pfizer vaccine. Really, for none of the vaccines are the virus in the vaccines, but specifically the two that are rolling out first, Pfizer and Moderna, uh, neither of those uh, have even part of the virus in them. They both are 
the delivery of a little piece of messenger RNA, some genes that cause our cells to produce just that spike protein. Just when we see the picture of the, uh, the coronavirus, the, the COVID virus, and there's that little, little, those little spikes sticking off the ball, it just causes our cells to, to make one of those little spikes and stick it out of the cell, out of the muscle cell, to show our white blood cells, hey, this is what the virus looks like. Uh, react against this when you see it. Uh, so it's, it's in no way is it the virus or even part of the virus. It's just a little bit of genetic material telling our body uh, how to make that protein so that we are prepared to fight it if we see it. Great. Thank you. All right, Alex, Dr. Matthew. Everyone, for the brief uh, introductions that you all gave, we have quite a few questions that have come in, and I just want to uh, also explain who I am and, and why I'm helping facilitate this conversation. So I'm the Associate Director of Integrating Special Populations, which is a program at Wake Forest Baptist and in, in the Maya Angelou Center that focuses on engagement with the community around research and trying to help educate and facilitate more involvement with the community in both the decision-making process as well as the research. And so this uh, town hall is really part of a larger effort that we are trying to uh, engage community at all levels around research um, so that you can have the most information possible to make the best decisions possible. And so some of the questions that we've, we've gotten have come from the community conversations, um, from social media, from text messages and emails, and, and also from this chat. What, kind of following up with the question about what's in the virus, Dr. Sanders, a lot of people have asked, does the, vi does the vaccine actually change my DNA? What would you say about that? Oh, that's a great question too, uh, Dr. Matthews. So no, uh, none of these vaccines actually change your DNA. And the messenger RNA vaccines, the ones that Pfizer and Moderna are putting out, um, that's just the part uh, when our naturally, when our DNA wants to make a protein, it it uh, it makes some RNA, and that RNA is read to make uh, make a uh, protein, and that RNA is immediately then just sort of dissolved and cut apart. So when we give this vaccine with this messenger RNA, it's going to get read, and in a in a in a day or two, it's going to be gone. Um, but but of course, when it's when the cells are pr producing these spike proteins our white blood cells might clip it off and uh, take care of that cell anyway. Uh, but the short answer is no, it does not genetically modify us in any way, and there won't be a residual amount of this genetic material left in us. Great, thank you so much. Um, and just a couple of follow questions. Dr. Laws talked about how we are trying to prioritize people with underlying health conditions, pre-existing health conditions. What do we know about the impact that the vaccine or the effectiveness of the vaccine on people with pre-existing health conditions? For example, sickle cell, pregnancy, and other health conditions like that. So we don't know about pregnancy, right? Because pregnant women were excluded from the, set, from the clinical trial, right? But I'll, I, I'll let the good doctor <laughs> um, take it from there. But we are saying that um, that pregnant women, if, if I'm understanding correctly, um, can get vaccinated. But we we I, we don't have any evidence to on this on, in this particular instance. Yeah. So I. I am always happy for Dr. Laws to take these hard questions, so no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to push it back to her. You know what? We're getting a lot of these questions, and so <laughs> I'm going to stay in my lane. My lane is... <laughs> well, the, I, I am going to... First, I'm going to totally agree with Dr. Laws that, um, that, that 
pregnant women were not included in these vaccine trials. So we don't really have any data-driven proof that uh, that it's safe in pregnancy or it's safe in lactating women. Uh, but our expectation is that it ought to be, especially in uh, women who are breastfeeding their babies, there should be no concern there. And almost all of the professional societies that take care of pregnant women or young babies are coming out with strong, encouraging statements saying, really, we should be considering, uh, uh, we should be considering offering the vaccine, certainly to, to women who have delivered recently, uh, but even making them available in trials to, to pregnant women because they're at risk. Um, next, for people with sickle cell disease or thalassemia or many of these uh, many of these blood uh, genetically uh, passed on blood changes, uh, we have seen no problem at all with the vaccine and sickle cell disease, for instance, or spherocytosis is another one uh, that that uh, causes uh, funny round red uh, red blood cells. We haven't seen any problem with the vaccine and those. What we have seen is a few cases where people who had sickle cell disease or one of these other blood disorders, when they got COVID, it triggered a crisis or it triggered uh, a breakage of their cells to where they, they got really bad anemia. And so what we think is that, you know, people with sickle cell disease or other, other blood disorders really you know, that probably need the vaccine more than more than others to protect them from that potential side effect of getting the infection. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanders. Um, so to the rest of the panelists, uh, there's, you know, a lot of people have been asking, you know, how are we going to communicate this information to the community, to the public? What would you all say is the best or the the best way to communicate this information, and how should we, um, and how should you all, I guess, or how could we, we leverage the organizations that you're a part of as a as a way to communicate with the public about about the vaccines? Mind uh, chiming in on on that one. Um, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about it. I, I really think as much as we all feel zoomed out, we have to continue to put this information in front of people as close to the ground as possible, um, spending time inviting people uh, to hear what experts are saying. Um, and, I, and I think that the, the effect of people seeing and hearing from people they know or who are sort of one degree removed from someone they know will compound the effectiveness of of increasing trust in the information and hopefully getting people to really have facts about the um, the vaccine and the opportunities that, that we have right now. Um, some of these questions that we're hearing tonight, you know, I'm hearing them from very well-educated people, you know, in congregations. So this really isn't a matter of education. Most of us just have no experience in immunology and, and very little experience with understanding how viruses work. You know, we know we get a flu or cold and we deal with it, but this is a, 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 an illness that kills people um, and has killed a lot of people. Yesterday, over 3,600 people. So we really want to, uh, I think, keep doing what we're doing. And it's gonna take a minute, but I think it's, it's gonna have some effectiveness. At least as one strategy. And I agree with Dr. Rivers. Um, you know, I would add that um, in addition to um, more zooms and zooms and zooms, um, the, the other thing here is um, is that you you know the NAACP and the Winston Salem Urban League in this last election um, registered an incredible number of people to vote. And, and part of the way that the organizations were able to do that, and we're not the only ones, obviously, but we just happen to be the ones on this call. Uh, but part of the way that we were able to do that is that people trusted the organizations. And so when someone showed up, um, when someone called you and said, I'm from the NAACP, I'm from the Winston Salem Urban League, um, people said, okay, well, you know, maybe this is that important. 
And, and so I, I do think that that process of, of community organizations vouching for the validity of this process and of, and, and of the vaccine is going to be really important. Uh, I think people presume that people like Reverend Spearman, uh, people like, uh, like, like Dr. Rivers and people like myself are going to fully vet uh, the vaccine before we come to, to them and say, uh, this is safe, please take it. And so if, if, if we come to folks, um, in, you know, through Zoom, through social media, um, you know, through churches, through community centers, and, and, and we say, and we urge people to, to, to be open to it, I think that we'll get uh, a really great response. Um, but so it, it is important that community organizations buy in and, and, and then um, that, that we, we mount a, a full press in order to, to mobilize this opportunity. I agree. Um, certainly with my pastor, that's my pastor, Pastor Rivers, by the way. Um, and with um, Mr. Perry, I, I think using those trusted voices, using the voices of physicians, um, black physicians, um, using the voices of, you know, elders in the community. Um, you know, in one of the, in a previous presentation, someone said, all it takes is for Big Mama to get on the phone and tell, start telling people. And I, you know, I know the backlash that that got from the Surgeon General, but I say it all the time. Um, you know, all it takes is for somebody that we trust, an elder in our community, to get on the phone and say, "Look, don't y'all, don't y'all get your butts in that line to take that thing." And for some pop, members of the population, that works. So we need, we we don't just need the doctors. We don't just need the clergy. We need. Uh, everybody that's trusted in our community, from our elders, from our youth, from our um, really standing behind the decisions that we agree on in a collective sense um, to, in terms of the vaccine. And, and, and I want to say, Dr. Matthews, you turned me on to this group, the Coalition of Blacks Against COVID. I think once I saw that the Black president of uh, the presidents of the historically black medical schools were signing on and they were getting by. I was like, oh, okay, I'm good. Um, and so I think um, I think having that level and then their beautifully done video, I was able to get DHHS. I said, look, don't even, we don't even need to invest in having one done like this or trying to have one done like this. We need to promote theirs. And so on DHHS's website, we now have the letter to the black community um, that was produced by, and we're sending out, that was produced by the Coalition um, of Blacks Against COVID. So I think we need to have a multi, um, you know, messenger, messenger as well as, um, you know, method uh, response, but we need to be consistent in the message. And, and so that I don't think needs to vary, but who's delivering it needs to needs to um, be a diverse, good representation, solid representation of trusted voices from our community. And not to take the role of, of panelists right now, but I think you know what's interesting is that there. Uh, I know the president of Xavier and Dillard sent out a letter to um, the network, their networks, um, encouraging people to participate in the Pfizer vaccine trial. And they got a lot of backlash for that um, by saying, you know, how could you um, ask us to participate in this trial? We know nothing about it, it you know, and the Tuskegee, right? And so I think there, it's not just about, or I'm curious about what your thoughts are about not just having uh, black leaders speak on it, but then also what what other pieces need to come into play when we think about that communication piece and that education. And this is not just for Dr. Laws, but for for others who are participating on the panel. Well, leadership is difficult, um, and the uh, and, and so one of the things that happens is that when you put yourself out there. Yeah, undoubtedly, there are going to be folks who disagree and folks who are cautious and folks who are angry. Um, and, you know, one of the, the challenges, I think, for, for everybody who's on this, um, in this WebEx meeting right now is that um, we're all leaders who have to make difficult decisions. And, and we recognize, um, you know, there's no doubt that 
if that if any of us, uh, Dr. Rivers, myself, or, or Reverend, Spe Reverend uh, Spearman, jump out and we say that um, that folks should try this, that we're going to get a backlash, and um, and and I think uh, that's okay. It's it's part of the process, and um, if, if we don't have thick skin, then you know we're supposed to be in this business. So the um, you know ultimately um, we have an obligation to be brave in this moment, and um, and and I think one of the things that I, that I hear um, you know among my colleagues here is that we're ready to step up. Uh, I, I happen to be from New Orleans, and and um, and so I was. Uh, Really paying close attention to to some of that backlash, and and I, I think that the black backlash was a lot louder than the number of people who were open to the idea of participating. My family's from Louisiana as well. Hey, <laughs> uh, what's up, cousin? Hey, cousin. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I think I was gonna. May I add just one thing? I'm so sorry. You know, sure. Um, I think about Harry Tubman saying, uh, you know, I freed thousands and I would have freed more had they, you know, some people just aren't going to come. Some people just aren't. My, I've got my sister. She's not having it. And I, she, she's not doing it. She, she, she's believing um, a pastor, pastor that she um, uh, follows on social media. And she believes this woman is, you know, anointed, and she believes this, you know, so she's, she's listening to her. Forget that her sister has a Ph.D. from BCU School of Medicine, and forget that I'm her sister and want her to live. I ain't going to, I don't want her to, you know, give her something that's going to kill her or hurt her, right? Um, but she's not coming. So I'm, I, and, and I'm thinking eventually maybe she will, right? So that's part of it, the recognition that not, but we also have to, has to keep it real with people. The last thing we want, to, what, what's the, what's, you know, what's, what's the greatest risk? Taking a vaccine that everybody in the world is taking, right? So Pfizer didn't just get clear; they got clear for us, but they're, I mean, the distribution is global. So taking a vaccine that everybody in the world um, will be taking, uh, and one that I think I heard. Some report on NPR that it's 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 almost right up there at the gold standard with the measles vaccine in terms of the the risk, which is very little, and the efficacy. Um, and so, standing in line to do that, or us collectively as a community not standing in line and continuing to die at disproportionately higher rates from a pandemic that's preventable in many ways, not just the three W's but also that has now a vaccine. And so I think having that message part of it too, and not just say, it's a, and not just say, okay, either you're going to, or, you know, the message is either take it or don't, or this is why you should or shouldn't. So I want to go back to some of the like basic questions um, and information about the vaccine. Cause I, I, you know, if we can talk about kind of the, the cultural uh, and social implications of it, but I think also people just need basic information about the vaccine. And so, Dr. Sanders, what um, what does it mean to have the vaccine? Do people test positive for COVID-19 if they have the vaccine? What does it do to the body? body. Uh, thanks, Dr. Matthews. So, it, like every vaccine, it is tricking the body into thinking that it's been infected to make an immune response without ever really infecting the uh, the, the person. Um, so in this case, if you get the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine, and quite frankly, I fully expect some of these other vaccines to work well and get uh, and to be on the market as as well. I, I hope so. I pray so. Um, and so when we get those vaccines, they will. Uh, trigger an immune response. Our white blood cells will see the vaccine and say, oh, this is what I'm supposed to fight against. This is how I'm supposed, this is what I'm practicing to fight when I see it in, in real life. So we will test positive probably for antibodies uh, to COVID because antibodies are the little proteins that our white blood cells make to block the virus. So if you get a blood test, looking for an antibody after you've been vaccinated, 
there's a good chance that you'll have an antibody that's positive. Um, but if you got one of those nasal swabs or spit swabs looking for the virus, you would not test positive for that. Um, the, the, you're trying to prevent that from happening. Great, and, and a follow-up question, you know, I saw in the phases of the distribution that there was a plan to give it to children, um, but we know that there hasn't been a lot of testing of the vaccine on children. How do we know whether the, our child should take it or not? What would, what would you say? What would, what would you say? Well, I, I may end up deferring this. I certainly want to hear from Dr. Laws about, uh, about public policy plans. Uh, but the initial studies on the vaccines stopped with adults. Uh, but Pfizer and then Moderna and others, uh, once they started to see how safe it was looking in adults, and quite frankly, I'm going to disagree with NPR a little bit. The vaccines are right up there in terms of efficacy with the measles vaccine, but they are probably safer than the, than the measles vaccine. It, um, I mean, these, these safety data so far have looked great. Um, so once they started seeing the safety data, uh, in, in adults, then they started to lower the age of people who could enroll as part of the trials. So they've been enrolling down to 12 year olds in, in some of these trials already. To my knowledge, nobody has, uh, nobody has extended those experiments uh, younger than 12 yet. But certainly, I expect that when they show that it's safe in teenagers, then they will open up under research to even younger children. We call that a, an age de-escalation study. So start with a, a young, healthy adult, and if it's, if it's okay in a young, healthy adult, then you can use it in older people or you can use it in younger people, and you do it step by step to show at each step that it's safe. So we, we will know more about pediatric uh, vaccina vaccinations very soon. Dr. Laws, please correct me if I got that wrong. From my knowledge, Faye, no. And I want to say, touche, I agree on the um, uh, comparison, though. <laughs> Thank you. But at least we know it's not worse. I think that's the main point, right? So. Um, one last kind of question, well, maybe not the last, but one another question, just scientific question. I've uh, also, just as background, uh, Dr. Laws and I have done a lot around HIV work, and a lot of people are asking questions about why, if why are we able to develop a vaccine for coronavirus so quickly if we haven't been able to develop, you know, effective vaccines for cancer or for HIV? Um, so, what would you say that uh, can help them better understand that process? Oh, what a complicated question that is. I'm only going to get myself in trouble trying to answer this. Um, I, I would say that HIV happens to just be a uniquely very difficult uh, virus to make a vaccine against. And if we go back to the 1980s when HIV was first discovered, the, the head of the Food and Drug Administration at the time said, oh my goodness, we don't have any good antiviral pills, antiviral medications, but we know how to make a vaccine. So we probably aren't going to be able to treat this very well, but within a year or two, we're going to have a vaccine. Well, here it is, you know, 50 years later uh, almost, and we still don't have a vaccine for HIV because of the way it gets inside our cells and changes its genes and the way it hurts our immune system, it's just been very, very difficult to, to, to make the vaccine against HIV. The good news is that we were, you know, able to make really good medicines against it. And that, that was a great surprise, but a, but a, but a scientific miracle. The, the reverse happens to be a little bit true with COVID, uh, that, uh, that that virus is just really tailor-made for making vaccines because it needs that spike to help bind to our cells and get into the cells and, and, and do its damage. 
Um, and because it needs that spike, and that spike is really good for generating an immune response, our scientists were able to develop vaccines really quickly to target that spike. And we just didn't have, didn't have the same really good target for HIV. I do want to, to point out, though, that, that just last year, we had little more than a year ago, we had a speaker from the vaccine center at NIH down here to meet with our medical students at Wake Forest and to give grand rounds to the doctors here. And his topic was his work on this messenger RNA vaccine um, for influenza and HIV, but that if one of these other viruses popped out of a bat, we could use that same technology to develop a vaccine really fast. That's exactly what happened. They, they've been working on this sort of technology for years, and one of the reasons they've been working on it so hard is because they have great hopes that it might lead to an effective HIV vaccine. So all the things that have come into fruition here with COVID, very, very much of that grew out of the work in HIV. And I pray, I pray and I'm optimistic that it's actually going to spin around, that we've had such great success with these technologies with COVID, that it's going to lead to better and better vaccines for HIV and cancer and things that we've not been able to do before this. And suddenly, we have tools to do it. I couldn't be more excited about that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, so, <laughs> Michelle, did you want to say something? I, I wanted to just say about the uh, a fear that I have, and especially among historically marginalized populations, response, you know, how they respond to the distribution plan is around the two dose requirement and the time period, right? So I think Pfizer's 28, one of them is 28 days, and the other one is they're under 30 days um, between the first dose and dose and the second dose. And we already know, right, when it comes to medication adherence, when it comes to follow-up pro um, um, appointments, when it comes to, you know, um, this pop, these, the populations that I'm really concerned about, um, we're, we're having to do work in, area, in other areas, um, helping to manage chronic health conditions and diseases as it relates to, you know, Following up, going to your follow-up appointment, going to some. So I think the messaging also needs to stress that it's two doses, that it's the, the efficacy that we're talking about, that's high, that's giving us hope, it's two, it's based on two doses. And I'm just hoping people don't go and get that first dose and then don't go back to get the second dose. And so that also has to be a part of the messaging, too, is that you've got to go, you've got to make sure that you go back. So, Dr. Laws, that, that was said so beautifully like a, like a true public health expert that I, I really just want to say amen and not, not contradict anything you said. But, uh, but if, if I could add just a, a little bit of nuance, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that finished enrollment today, that's right, one, one dose, and they closed enrollment today. Wake Forest vaccinated our last uh, volunteer wonderful African-American woman who stepped up and said, hey, you know, we need more African-American women in this, uh, in this study, and, and she, she came in and got vaccinated this afternoon. Um, that's what, yeah, that's one dose, and that vaccine may, may be out before the end of January, and that, that could make a difference. That's I also right. did, that's right. did want to say one other thing. Did you look at that data about Pfizer, how well it worked after even one dose? It's really encouraging. I still want people to get two doses. <laughs> but even after one dose, things looked a whole lot better. It did, but we want to make sure people get two. So we're not going to confuse them. We'll just say, <laughs> we're not going to even share that with them, right? There's some stuff we're going to just keep, keep to ourselves. <laughs> yeah, keep the message clear. Yeah, keep the message clear. So um, just for, for those folks who are calling in, I just want to uh, – I forgot to say this earlier. You can text questions to 336-462-9503. That's uh, 336-462-9503.
but we have been trying to field questions as they've come in through the chat. So please continue to keep um, sending me questions and, um, you know, and we'll, and we'll field them in. So I want to open this up again to the, to the rest of the panelists. Uh, we, we, we are especially interested in thinking about how we can, you know, going back to that question about mistrust and how do we address mistrust? I think a lot of times when we talk about that topic, we're always thinking about how community members should just should change their attitudes about us, right, as researchers and as organizations and institutions. But what can we do as organizations um, to become trustworthy? Uh, what are the things that need to be, what do we need to see? What are the things that need to be done? And what are the things that we are doing, you all are doing, to be trustworthy organizations? Dr. Matthews, that's a great uh, question. And it goes to something I was going to bring up earlier, which is um, just one small thing. And, and I think it's happening tonight. It is the way we communicate has to be very thoughtful and deliberate so that we're even just the words we're using uh while they may be uh pretty ordinary in in the uh research offices and with our colleagues uh remembering that um you know two and three uh rows out uh, in terms of how people hear these words even a word like efficacy i mean we all know on this call uh what it means um but it's a it's a variation of a common word, you know, efficient or effective, um, but making sure we're speaking these complex uh, scientific uh, ideas in, in really the most basic language that we can, not because people aren't intelligent, but because it's a it's a jargon that um, is very um, field specific. So I think that's one thing, just recognizing that we may have to translate some things to make sure the broadest group of people understand them uh, as possible. I, I think that's right. Um, you know, in my social media, uh, there's a video going around of a, um, I think a doctor at the uh, University, University Medical Center in El Paso uh, getting the, uh, the vaccination and um, and everyone alleges that it's an empty syringe. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and I've also seen uh, a number of really popular folks and celebrities, uh, you know, latch on to the idea that it is, that this is SARS and there are other there are products, for instance, on Lysol, it, it lists that it treats SARS or that it can kill SARS. And so they say, well, you know, how is this new if SARS has been around for so long? And, and there are all these these theories, and and and, and I you know I can go on and on and on with with, with uh, about these. I'm sure many of many of you could do the same. But I, I guess my my point is that a lot of it comes from miscommunication or unclear communication. And um, and so I think we saw um, Dr. Laws do exactly what what needs to be done um, in the most respectful way uh, to Dr. Sanders, which was to say, hey, <laughs> we're going to send this really clear. Um, message that with the current vaccines, there are two doses, um, and you have to take one, and then 28 days, and you take the other, and nothing else and, until there until there's um, an ability to be clear, concise, and direct about something else. And um, I think it's it's incredibly important. The, the last thing I'll say about this, um, we have a, a great relationship with the Winston Salem um, NAACP, and. Um, and a lot of times on, on advocacy issues, we'll, most of the time, we try to work together. And, and so we'll get together beforehand and figure out what our messaging is and then try our best to stay on point with that message and not stray from it. And, and, and so I think that that's a lot of what's going to need to happen. And some of it is going to take time, right? Um, you know, I remind people, we, everyone knows we talk about it all the time and even – tonight um, about Tuskegee. Well, it, that was a study sanctioned by the United Public Health Service, right, with D, which was under DHHS and 
Um, and so some of it's just going to, people are going to have to, we're going to have to demonstrate our trustworthiness by everything that we do going forward, everything that we do, because one little, one little misstep can take us all the way back to, um, you know, people saying, you know, I'm not having anything to do with anything that's sanctioned by the government. And so I'm, I'm mindful of it taking time. And even within DHHS, um, when they convened the, the advisory, the vaccine advice, that's not my wheelhouse. It wasn't my wheelhouse. It wasn't, and it wasn't until, but I insisted in being at meetings, um, and it wasn't until I saw Dr. Goldie Bird's name, and they said, well, we got Dr. Goldie Bird. She's I was like, oh, okay, cool. So I can shift my focus back over here because she's watching this and I'll trust what, you know? And so even within our agencies and um, you know, we have to, we, I think we have to do things differently to demonstrate that we are trustworthy and it can't be the same things that we've done. And I've said that to the secretary and others. Um, we got to be intentional about who we bring to the table. When you bring pastors to the table, don't just bring them to the table just because you know it looks good. Make sure whatever information they're sharing with you, we figure out how to make it happen if, it, if we're asking their help to help deliver this message. Or we, you know, really, so um, you're bringing the NAACP to the table. You're bringing them to the table, you know, because you're scared not to or you, you realize they do have a far reach. Well, utilize their expertise and um, in helping us to, to craft our messages, helping us to develop our policies. And then there has to be some reimbursements, right? There has to be, I don't even want to get into the issue about should we pay people to take the vaccine? No, is my perspective. No, we shouldn't. Um, but, um, but I do think we need to look at ways that we are, um, you know, comp that we are showing and demonstrating that this relationship that we have with communities isn't just transactional, but it is really trying to build re true, authentic relationships so we don't end up here at the next pandemic trying to figure out, okay, you know, the, how do we bring the most impacted communities to? We wouldn't have to because they'll be there. So building trust takes time, and, and we have to demonstrate it through everything that we do, from our messaging, who's the messenger, I'll be quiet after this. <laughs> um, they brought to us who they had identified was going to, you know, be this celebrity um, voice in one of the PSAs. And um, one of the younger team, millennial team members who works with Cornell Shaw said, well, no, I'll, if you're trying to reach youth, no, I think, I think you need this person, Rhapsody, right? So, um, they were like, we don't know who that is. And we asked, and this person emerged. Well, that person emerged with a whole other group that wasn't even the target population. And so, um, but that, but, but, but the person who said, no, that's not going to work, Green Rhapsody, um, used her and said, it went nowhere. We, the other, per the other voice was being chosen and that ended up going nowhere because everybody that looked at the draft cut of it or version was like, this isn't going to go anywhere. So um, trust the voices of the people that we're serving that they know best about how better and best to serve them. And not just think because we've got all these fancy titles behind our name, you know. If Rhapsody says do it, I'll do it. She did. Right, well, she is. We're doing. We're getting her. I've, yeah. We. She's. Well, she, yeah. She's going to be doing something. Um. For right. me on behavioral health. That's great. Um. Yeah. On the, Dr. Sanders, do you have any thoughts? I, I'm. I'm not going to follow that. That was. That was very good. Thank you. So, I, well, I, I, I did kind of want you to speak about some of the efforts that Wake Forest Baptist and, and the COVID-19 efforts are doing to try to build community, build community relationships. relationships. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Matthews. Thanks for, thanks, for, thanks for pointing me where you wanted me to be. I, I always need that. Um, uh, yes, uh, 
you know, certainly Wake Forest takes seriously this idea that we need to be a trusted uh, institution as well. And, and we recognize that, uh, that we've got a history that we have to deal with, that we have to acknowledge, and that we have to uh, very transparently move, continue to move forward and make sure that everyone knows that, that we, are, we are all in this together. We want to be in this together, and we want to take care of each other as, as, we're, as we're going forward. One of the ways that we're doing that uh, here at Wake Forest during this COVID epidemic has been with the COVID-19 Community Research Partnership. So we have been trying very hard to reach out into every segment of our geographic community, uh, making sure that all of those in this region have a voice to be able to share with each other what's going on in the epidemic by reporting their symptoms, by reporting potential contacts, uh, by informing each other about how well we're doing wearing masks, how well we're doing uh, taking preca appropriate precautions. And then we're also sending out monthly antibody tests to people to help track you know, how many people might have been exposed, how many people might have been infected. And now that the vaccines are rolling out, you know, those, those antibody tests, some people have asked me, what well, do they mean anything anymore? Well, yeah, now, now we really want to see, is there a difference in how people are responding? Can we use those antibodies as markers for how long? But right now with the vaccines, we've got great information that they're super effective for at least a few months and that they're super safe. Uh, but we don't know yet for how long are they effective. And we don't know how effective they are in every single part of the population. I mean, we expect that some people are going to get better responses than others. And so the CDC and the NIH and, and every, you know, our DHHS, everybody wants to get as much information about how we're doing through this epidemic as possible. And the Community Research Partnership is one of our big efforts to try to do that. And we've been very proactive in trying to make sure that we are reaching out to everybody. And when I say we, I need to thank, you know, Dr. Matthews and Dr. Bird and so many community leaders in the, in the region who get together regularly. Every week they get together and say, are we doing this right? Are we making this, are we doing this communication properly? Are we reaching out to people respectfully and appropriately? Are we making these things available the way we should? And can't tell you how much I appreciate that guidance and, uh, and, and really that uh, sometimes forceful encouragement. I, I, I appreciate you making us do it properly. Um, and I think it's, uh, it, it, it has been very successful. I, and Allison, if it's okay, I wanna give people a sneak peek of some data that we hope is released in the press tomorrow we did a quick little survey in the Community Research Partnership last week, asking people how many gathered for Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, how many gathered or traveled, how many, if you did gather or travel, did you wear masks? We really started off by saying, did you follow DHHS's guidelines? Did you, did you do what you've been asked to do? And I would say, sadly, overall, we didn't do all that great. About 50% of us reported that, no, we ignored them. We uh, we got together anyway, uh, and and then as you do the breakdown, uh, about a third of us, you know, if we ignored people, and we got together. We did do we did at least do some of those recommendations. Interestingly, we did not find that healthcare workers were better behaved than non healthcare workers. In fact, maybe healthcare workers were a little bit riskier than non healthcare workers. We did find that African Americans followed the recommendations much better than Caucasians. For what that's, for what that's worth, you know, way to go, African-American community, uh, that showed up well in the, uh, uh, in the, the COVID-19 community research partnership. So that's our little bit of, uh, of sneak peek data. Thank you all for, uh, all of you who are participating, thank you for participating. We have over 35,000 volunteers in North Carolina giving daily data and monthly antibodies, but we have a lot more room. We would really like more volunteers. We would especially like more Hispanic and African-American volunteers to make sure we've got really good representation. 
even if you're getting the vaccine, which we want you to do, we still want to track how well everything is going in the epidemic. So, uh, so please come join Dr. Matthews, Dr. Bird, and me in that effort. Thank you so much. Thank you so, much. so I see so we I have quite a few more questions about um, the vaccine. I know we we're at the 7:30 mark. Um, if you don't, if you all don't mind, we're just going to try to knock out some of these questions because I want to make sure that people get their questions answered. So some of the questions are about what time. Uh, so going back to that two week window, there's definitely some concern about how do we know? Can you explain that two step vaccination vaccination process? What does the when does the vaccine peak or is most effective to an individual? I think we answered some of that. I'm just going to give you a couple questions um, so we can answer them and then. Um, how long after someone has received the vaccine are they immunized or protected uh, from the vaccine? And if and what what do we anticipate are the major barriers to accessing the vaccine? So, so Dr. Laws, you correct me if I get this wrong. Pfizer and Moderna are both two shot vaccines. Pfizer is 21 days apart and uh, Moderna is 28 days apart. So you take one and then you get a booster 21 or 28 days later. We have lots of vaccines that we do similar multi doses. And the reason we do that is that uh, some people will respond well after one shot, but a lot of us need to prime our immune system, show it that spike protein, and then show it to us again. Some of us need to study harder for a test than others. And we want to give the immune system two shots, extra study time, extra practice, so that it's ready to, uh, to uh, when, the, when you see the virus. Many people will get some protection after that first shot, but to get to that 95% efficacy that we're talking about, and when we say 95% efficacy, we mean that uh, if you vac if there were going to be a hundred people who got COVID and you vaccinated those 100 people, 95 of them would be protected and would not get it. Only five would. So it's great protection. 95 out of 100 people who would have gotten COVID would be protected. That takes two shots with those two vaccines. And how long does that protection last? I guess the most honest answer is we don't know yet. And it lasts it lasts at least several months. We've got now several months of data and it's been great, but we need to follow people a lot longer before we find out, do we need a, do we need a booster dose in a year? Do we need a booster dose every five years? Does it last even longer than that? We just aren't sure yet. Um, Dr. Laws, Dr. or Mr. Perry, uh, what do you anticipate are some of the barriers to accessing vaccines? Even though it's free, um, people who don't have health insurance may not don't may not have you know a, a history of going to the doctors or anything other than an emergency. And so saying show up at a Walgreens or what have you is, 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 I think, breaking through some of the barriers. But I think I'm more concerned about the behaviors of people that we know who aren't accustomed and who don't have a primary care physician, who don't have a regular medical home. Um, so that's one concern for me. The barrier is letting those people know, really, truly, it's free. You show up, they vaccinate you. And, it, and and I'm 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 getting some questions. Is it really free? Do they charge me for the visit and not the vaccine? Do they? And so we got to flesh out some of that. And I think that that's one big. I think that's the biggest barrier is um, defining free vaccine. Um, yeah, that's one barrier. And then uh, you know, people who are mistrusting and who just aren't going to go um, at first, 
making sure that these people aren't the, aren't practicing that they are practicing the three W's and that everybody's still practicing the three W's until you get vaccinated and even afterwards. I say um, for a while, right? And so having have, having folk to understand what that means that it's not. You know, it's not it's not a, a not a time for us to put our put our guards down to stop practicing the three W's. It's not a time for us to sit and do nothing and watch and wait. And so those are some barriers, I think, not to necessarily getting the vaccine, but the the what the vaccine can do in terms of reversing the trend in our community. That's my concern. The vaccine is part of it, but I'm not sure if we're going to see that. That, that drop in the deaths and cases in these HMP populations just because we now got the vaccine. There's still some other fact, other stuff out there we've got to work through. Allison, um, I just want, I'm going to jump in right now. Um, we have, we have held you all over and we're so appreciative of the work that you are doing. And certainly the work that you've done tonight fielding all of these questions. What I think we should do is take the remaining questions and answer them. I have them answered. And then we, we have everybody has registered. So I think we could just send them out. Uh, I, I don't want to hold. I, kn I know some of you have been on call today. <laughs> I know all of us have. And, and don't worry, we'll be back. And we'll be calling on this team again. But I do want to respect your time, and, and we do want you to come back, so we, we have to treat you well, right? <laughs> but this has been so wonderful, and we just appreciate all of the great work that's being done in North Carolina and all of the, the messaging that so many different pockets are trying to, to make. And I think we'll get there. I believe the numbers will change. I believe our perceptions is as just as soon as we can help get folks educated and they're aware of these very topics that we had tonight, um, people make good decisions and we just need to do our part. The trustworthiness piece is very important and so that's one of the things that we continue to work on here at, at Way to, to, to consider our trustworthiness and what we're doing, the work we're doing and how we're doing it. And so we want as many people as, as possible to be safe. And this vaccine, we believe, can help us to be safe. So thank you all so much. We want to thank our listening audience. And again, stay tuned because we will be back. Allison, thank you so much for your for your hard work as, as well tonight and helping us to get through this. And with that, we'll ask Dr. Williams to come back. We like to ask pastors to come back and do things. As, as Dr. Law said, uh, we've got to keep them involved with our work all the time. And certainly he is one of those in our network who is at work all the time. Dr. Williams, would you just give us the benediction so we can go? Thank you all very much. Yes, uh, thank you once again, Dr. Bird, and to the team. Shall we uh, be invited to join in the closing prayer at this time? First and foremost, thank you, Father, for uh, allowing us to all to gather in a virtual space. We feel more inspired, more informed, we're certainly more eager to go out and make a difference in this world, which clearly still has more questions than answers. May you tonight bless, Lord, our director for the Maya Angelou Center for Health Equity. May you continue to give her vision and inspiration to soar high, to touch many, and to change lives with a life-changing experience. Bless our panelists tonight for all of their efforts, Dr. Rivers, Dr. Spearman, Dr. Laws, Dr. Jones, and Attorney Perry. Bless them for their efforts. And may we all leave this place knowing that we have made a positive contribution. May you continue, Father, to bless the Maya Angelou Center staff as we strive for a spirit of excellence and making a difference in the communities we serve. To our listening audience, we now, Father, ask your blessings on them. Give them peace that surpasses man's understanding. Is our prayer in your Father. Son, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you.